I am a cell biologist, so I've spent most of my career looking down a microscope at tiny cells. However, I got this unique opportunity to apply my cell biology knowledge upwards towards astronauts and future space travels. Now, becoming an astronaut might be the ultimate fantasy to some of you, but as I'll describe today, depending on your activities here on Earth, or lack thereof, you might be closer to being like an astronaut than you actually think. So how did I get involved in this? I study cells of the bone. So what you're looking at, that purple smear, is a section through the bone. And those little dots inside of it are the cells. Now, bone is an unusual organ in that it's mostly extracellular material. That is material that is outside the cell. And this material consists of proteins like collagen that are made and secreted by the cells that has been calcified and mineralized. So this is where the all-important calcium requirement in your diet comes from to make healthy teeth and bones. Upon calcification, bone becomes this very rigid, strong organ, which is really important for the function of the skeleton to hold us up and to protect our internal organs. But when I say bone is rigid, I don't mean that it's a fixed structure. It's very dynamic. It's constantly being remodeled. In fact, all of the bones in your body be will be completely replaced in every 10 years or so. So if you consider it, we've had lots of architectural talks today, if you consider bone like walls of a house, there are new walls constantly being added and old walls being torn down. This is the remodeling process. And this is where the cells come into play. So fortunately for me and you, it's a fairly simple organ. There's only two cell types that you see in that cartoon. So on the one hand, you have osteoblasts, and they build bone. They essentially make that collagen and deposit it outwards. And they're so effective at this that they actually become entrapped inside their own bone matrix. And that's those spider-type cells that you see at the bottom. And once entrapped in the bone, they become very sensitive to strains or loading and compressing forces in the bone. And that will stimulate them to make more bone. And we'll get back to that later. Now, on the other side of the coin, there are those relatively large osteoclasts. So they chew through the bone like a Pac-Man. They tunnel through. And they do this by secreting outside acids, like hydrochloric acid, and enzymes. So you have bone constantly being built and bone being destroyed. And this happens all the time in our body, every day. But what's critical to maintain a healthy bone mass, their activities have to be equal, right? Equal bone formation, equal bone destruction. And when diseases arise is when you get a shift in that equilibrium. So that brings us to astronauts. So here again, ultimate fantasy. No, I'm not referring to George Clooney here. I'm referring to your typical busy, talented astronaut who's out exploring the cosmos and experiencing this very unique environment of microgravity. But this is not without obvious perils. Our bone, our bodies have evolved in the presence of gravity, and it reacts when you remove this force. So astronauts, amongst many physiological complications, experience severe muscle loss or muscle atrophy, and severe bone loss. And this is known, you know it as osteoporosis, but it's a specific type of osteoporosis. It's called disuse osteoporosis. Osteoporosis that's been induced by the lack of weight-bearing activity. It has the same phenotype as the more common postmenopausal osteoporosis, but that's caused by a lack of hormones. This is caused by the lack of weight-bearing activities. And it's not unique to astronauts. It's also experienced by people on Earth who can't walk or patients who are bedridden for long periods of time. And more broadly, it's experienced by people who sit on their couch too much, people who will watch a Netflix series from beginning to end consecutively in one sitting, and you know who you are. <laughs> so you've been kind enough to show up today and we've made you sit on your butts all morning, so now I've made you feel uncomfortable. So if you're able, 
Could everyone please stand up and wait there for a moment? This is the TEDx seventh inning stretch. So let's all stand up with good posture, of course. Okay, so we are loading our bones now. All right, and everyone's different size and shape, so some of us are just naturally more effective at loading your bones. But don't take that as a bad thing. It's well known that thinner people are more prone to osteoporosis than people who aren't thin. So you can take this away as an <laughs> excuse to bulk up, enjoy your bonbons at home, but don't do it while you're sitting, while you're standing, of course. Okay, so I want you to feel which bones are taking the bulk of your weight, because these are the bones that are gonna go into culture shock when you remove that weight. So just starting from the top, yes or no, do you think it's your skull? No. How about upper shoulders? No. Upper, upper torso? No. Here? Yes, right? This is taking the hit. So your lower spine, the lumbar spine, your hips, your femurs, this is supporting the bulk of your weight. And this is the area where you get osteoporosis when you then remove that weight and becomes very prone to fractures. So thank you for that exercise. Take a load off. Have a seat. So the space agencies clearly have a vested interest in figuring out what's wrong with the cells, that you're getting this disequilibrium, you're getting this bone loss. An astronaut, on average, loses 1% to 2% of their bone mass per month. So we want to ultimately send our astronauts to Mars, and the round trip, including sightseeing in Mars, is roughly two to three years. So we're looking at over 30% of total bone loss, which puts them at severe risk for fractures amongst many other complications. So the European and the Canadian space agencies put out a call for proposals for bone cell biologists to see what was wrong with those cells. And I saw this call for proposal, and I mulled over it, and I came up with a hypothesis based on my studies on Earth and things I knew about the architecture of these cells and based on microgravity studies that had been done in different cell types. So I put it all together and I won't bore you with all the molecular details, but if you're a student in the audience, you know these details because I inflict it upon you as part of your coursework. But the gist of it is, as I felt with good evidence, is that the osteoblasts, the builders, were preferentially uh, in trouble in space, whereas the osteoclasts, I felt, you know, they might be a little affected, but they should proceed as normal. But less bone formation, normal bone degradation, leads to net bone loss. So I sent off my proposal, and six months later was very delighted to hear that I was one of three labs that were chosen. So the mission began. So this is our bad imitation of simulated microgravity at the European Space Agency. The two young women are Arian and Nushin, who grew the cells, and on either side of us are Perry and Bastian from the Canadian Space Agency. The first thing we had to do was figure out how to grow these cells in vitro in an apparatus that could withstand launch and landing forces. So that brings us to the show and tell component of this talk. So fortunately for us, this brilliant Canadian company designed this hardware. I'll just open it up. Uh, feel free on the break to come up and I can walk you through the parts, but you can see them all up here on the slide. So up at the top right, you see the bioreactors, which is just fancy space lingo for containers. That's where the cells were. So osteoblasts and osteoclasts were grown on bone in these bioreactors, and they were kept fed and happy through media, which was perfused through them by those syringes on the bottom. Now, what was particularly genius about this is that it was fully automated, which meant that we didn't rely on as have to rely on astronaut help, which was important as the shuttle program wound down. What this meant was that we could fly this on an unmanned satellite. So that's what we did. So, we loaded the cells up at the European Space Agency, and the payload, 
was taken via planes, trains, and automobiles to Bakunor, Russia, where they were literally and logically crammed inside of this Photon M3 satellite, amongst many other experiments from around the world. This was put atop the reliable Soyuz rocket launchers and blasted into space. So it then orbited the Earth for two weeks, and then the final syringe in here contained fixative. So prior to landing, the cells were fixed in space, so they wouldn't experience 1G when they came back to Earth. And then the satellite landed somewhere in the plains of Kazakhstan. That's what they told us. That's where it would be. And remarkably, they found it within one to two hours by helicopter. And yes, that's exactly the same type of spacecraft that returned Sandra Bullock safely to Earth. <laughs> so in front of the satellite, that is Lowell Meisner. So he is the genius that created this hardware. So he got our samples and shipped it back to UTSC here where we did all the analysis. So I just want to show you a little bit of data so you get a taste for the results. What we're looking at here is the nuclei, the center of the cell, of the osteoblast. Now this is in the ground control. Students know you always have to have a ground control. So the exact replica was kept on Earth while the cells were being flown in space. So in this ground control, the nuclei had this nice, healthy oval shape as they should when cells are happy. When we looked at the space-flown cells, we saw something different. So the DNA in these cells was condensed, it was fragmented, it was in indicative of cells that were in deep trouble that were undergoing programmed cell death or cell suicide. And what's readily apparent is that there was also less of them. So as they died, they lifted off the bone and floated away. And shown down in the cartoons are the other components of the cell that we analyzed. I won't go into detail, but the architecture was severely disrupted in these cells, leading to their demise. So as per the hypothesis, yes, osteoblasts, the ones that make the bone, they were severely compromised in space. Now, what about the osteoclasts, the ones that chew up the bone? So what you're looking at next is just a slice of the bone. So we've experimentally removed the cells. You can't see the cells. What you can see is the footprint they left behind. Those whitish areas are where they degraded bone. So this is the typical resorption degradation pattern you see in the control cells, the ground controls. Now, unexpectedly, when we looked at the space-flown cells, we saw, in fact, that there was enhanced bone degradation. So this means that astronauts are facing the worst of both possible scenarios. They're not getting bone being made, and they're getting more bone being chewed up. So they're getting this double whammy effect, which explains the severe osteoporosis that they experience. So now that we have an idea of what cell types are affected, and unfortunately it's both of them, the space agencies are interested in coming up with intervention measures to prevent the bone loss. And I have submitted a proposal to try vitamin supplementation to keep the osteoblast healthy and osteo, uh, anti resorptive agents to suppress, to quiet the osteoclast. So that's being assessed. We'll see if it flies. Uh, in the meantime, if you want to be involved in space research, but you find cell biology rather dull, it's okay, it happens, you can uh, immediately volunteer for these very glamorous bed rest studies. So this is where otherwise healthy adults lie in bed for up to six months at a time playing video games. Now, I can hear the students in the audience, forget astronauts, this is the ultimate fantasy, right? <laughs> so it also serves as a cheap and accessible way to test some of these interventions. And I want to share with you just one study that's really interesting and brings home the importance of weight-bearing activities. They asked some of these subjects to stand, simply stand, as we were doing earlier, for one hour of the day. The rest of the time they were in bed. 
doing that significantly reduced the bone loss. It didn't stop it altogether, but there was a significant improvement just simply by standing, showing the power, the importance, how much our body relies on weight-bearing activities. Now, we want to do better than that, and I'm interested in, in ways to not just slow down bone loss, but prevent it from happening altogether. And I'm particularly interested both as a bone cell biologist, but also as an aging female who will most likely experience postmenopausal osteoporosis. So I've been uh, working with undergrads and, and looking to the sports literature for the ideal types of activities to try and prevent bone loss. Now, I've talked about simply standing. On top of that, it's really important to use your muscles, flex your muscles. And that's because muscle attaches to bone, and every time you flex, it pulls on the bone, causing these little microstraints. And that stimulates the bone, the osteoblast, to make more bone. On top of that, impact is important. So jolting your bones. And going back to walls of the house, if your house is in an earthquake zone, you're not going to want to take down the walls. You want to keep adding to the walls to fortify the walls. And that's how the cells react. And you look at athletes that are in high-impact sports, and they have incredibly strong bones. Now, can you guess which type of athlete has the strongest of all bones? They have bones like tree trunks, and, and not just the lower limbs, but the upper limbs as well. Okay. is experiencing up to 15 G upon landing. So you all know what you have to do now, right? <laughs> More realistically, I, I'm working with my undergrads and we're trying to come up with a safe and a user-friendly workout regime to get maximal bone, the strongest type of bones. And we have a logo. It's down. There it goes. So we've got a logo now, Sturdy Bones, so watch for this in the next couple of years. But you really, you don't need a program. Just with the knowledge of the bone, the importance of weight bearing, the importance of muscles, the importance of impact, you can apply this to your daily activities. So my take home message basically is get up off the couch, stop sitting at a microscope all day, get out there, be active, and reach for the stars for your full potential. Thank you very much for listening.